I'm Eric Strong from the Palo Alto Veterans Hospital and Stanford University. Today, I will be talking to you about hyperglycemic crises, specifically diabetic ketoacidosis and the hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Here are the learning objectives of this talk. First, to be able to define, recognize, and discriminate between diabetic ketoacidosis and the hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state. Second, to understand the basic pathophysiology of each syndrome. Finally, to understand their general treatment strategies, including potential complications from treatment. So first, what is diabetic ketoacidosis, or DKA, and what is the hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state, or HHS? These are two of the most serious acute complications of diabetes. As we will sh see shortly, they share some pathophysiologic mechanisms and clinical features. However, on the most basic level, DKA is a combination of hyperglycemia, ketosis, and acidemia, while HHS is a combination of hyperosmolarity, hyperglycemia, and altered mental status. Some clinicians may use alternative terms for HHS, such as hyperosmolar non-ketosis, which may be abbreviated as HONK, or H-O-N-K. However, my impression is that these alternative terms are starting to become less common in fa favor of HHS. Occasionally, I have been asked whether a, the diagnoses of DKA and HHS are mutually exclusive. While they're not mutually exclusive necessarily by definition or pathophysiologic mechanisms, I have personally never seen a patient in whom I was convinced both syndromes were occurring simultaneously. While my personal experience certainly does not rule out this possibility, it does suggest that if it can occur, it is probably a rare event. Let's look at the epidemiology of these two syndromes. As with many medical conditions, the traditional teaching does not exactly match reality. The traditional teaching is that DKA is seen predominantly in type 1 diabetics and those under 65 years of age, while HHS is seen predominantly in type 2 diabetics and those over 65 years of age. In reality, however, most patients with either DKA or HHS have type 2 diabetes, and many patients with DKA are older than 65. This diagram demonstrates from where some of these misconceptions originate. First, you can see that among all patients, both sick and healthy, there are fewer type 1 diabetics than type 2 diabetics. Type 1 patients are more likely to develop a hyperglycemic crisis, and that hyperglycemic crisis is more likely to be DKA than HHS. However, even though a risk of acute crises is lower in type 2 patients than in type 1, because there are many more of them, most patients with these complications are type 2. As a side note, you can also see that HHS is overall slightly less common than DKA, though this largely depends on your patient population. For example, anecdotally, at my home institution of the Palo Alto VA Hospital, where the average patient is older and more chronically ill than at most other hospitals, I find HHS to be equally prevalent, if not more so than DKA. Regarding the mortality of DKA and HHS, in current times, DKA actually has a remarkably good prognosis with a mortality of less than 1%, while the short-term mortality in patients with HHS is around 5 to 10%. This surprises many people, since patients with DKA generally have significantly more electrolyte and acid-based arrangements. The explanation is that the fatalities in both conditions are usually due to com comorbid conditions or the triggering event for the hyperglycemic crisis. Since patients with HHS tend to be older and more chronically ill than those with DKA, their mortality rate is higher. Let's move on to talk about the pathogenesis of these conditions. As with the epidemiology, Traditional teaching does not match reality. That traditional teaching usually explains the difference between these conditions by stating that DKA is due predominantly to too little insulin, while HHS is due to too much glucose. This is a tremendous oversimplification. In reality, there's a great amount of overlap in the pathogenesis of the two syndromes. I want to talk a bit about these overlapping pathophysiologic mechanisms because it will lead to a better understanding of the triggers of each syndrome, as well as their distinct clinical features. First, some patients will develop worsened insulin deficiency. Maybe this is due to medication noncompliance with insulin, 
or maybe it's because we're seeing a first presentation of type 1 diabetes in a patient. Whatever the reason, insulin deficiency will lead to increased lipolysis, which then leads to increased delivery of free fatty acids to the, to the liver. In the liver, these excess free fatty acids get converted into keto acids. Next, as a separate problem, some patients may have excess glucagon, catecholamines, and or cortisol, all of which may be due to an acute infection or excessive physiologic stress, such as that seen in a myocardial infarction. These excess hormone levels will upregulate the pathways leading to keto acids. They will also lead to decreased protein synthesis and increased protein breakdown, which will provide more substrates for gluconeogenesis. At the same time, both insulin deficiency and excess glucagon will directly lead to decreased glucose utilization by peripheral tissues. This combination of decreased glucose utilization and increased gluconeogenesis by the liver have an additive effect to produce hyperglycemia. The hyperglycemia leads to an osmotic diuresis and subsequent dehydration. And if the patient has limited thirst or access to water, as might be seen with someone who is either ill and or confused, this dehydration will quickly lead to hyperosmolarity. So we now have the three important pathophysiologic endpoints, ketoacidosis, dehydration, and hyperosmolarity. These first two endpoints are key features of DKA, while the second and third endpoints are key features of HHS. The fact that the hyperosmolarity required for the formation of HHS is a consequence of poor water intake helps to explain why this condition is more often seen in older, chronically ill patients. Let's move on to discussing how one can recognize a hyperglycemic crisis and how one can distinguish DKA from HHS at the bedside. The major symptoms of DKA include polyuria and polydipsia, dyspnea, abdominal pain, and nausea and vomiting. The polyuria and polydipsia are due to the osmotic diuresis from excessive glucose spilling into the urine. The dyspnea is from the body's attempt to blow up carbon dioxide to compensate for the buildup of keto acids and to restore pH closer to normal. The mechanism of the abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting is actually not well understood. The symptoms of DKA typically develop over less than a day. While HHS also has prominent polyuria, with or without polydipsia, the other distinguishing feature is altered mental status, which is a consequence specifically of hyperosmolarity. The symptoms of HHS typically develop over greater than a day, closer to two to four days. Regarding exam findings in these patients, both will have generalized signs of dehydration, and as just mentioned, patients with HHS will always have some degree of altered mental status. There are two interesting signs unique to DKA. First is the eponymously named Kussmaul respirations. These are respirations that are of normal rate, but excessively deep, such that the patients will have an elevated minute ventilation. The mechanism for this is presumably increased respiratory drive as a consequence of low arterial pH. However, it's not clear why this finding is much more commonly described in DKA than in other forms of metabolic acidosis. The other unique sign in DKA is a fruity odor to the patient's breath, which is a consequence of high levels of acetone, which is one of the three ketone bodies formed during DKA. As an interesting side note, apparently not every person has the ability to smell acetone. But while I have personally heard physicians ascribe a specific percentage to the fraction of the population lacking this ability, such numbers are not based on reliable scientific studies. Along those lines, there is actually no significant literature evidence regarding the sensitivity and specificity of either Kussmaul respirations or acetone breath. In practice, the major way to distinguish between DKA and HHS is actually on labs. Here's a table that highlights the most important values to look for. First, plasma glucose. In DKA, it could be anywhere from a relatively low 250 to about 800. In HHS, the glucose is almost always at least above 600, and there really isn't a known specific upper bound. The highest sugar I've personally observed in such a patient is about 1200. Second, arterial pH. With mild DKA, 
it may be only modestly acidotic, while in moderate to severe DKA, it will be more so. In HHS, pH is most commonly normal, though may be ever so slightly acidotic. Next, serum bicarbonate levels in mild DKA tend to be around 15 to 18, lower than 15 in severe DKA, and higher than 18 in HHS. Urine and serum ketones are usually but not always positive in mild DKA, but much more consistently positive in more severe cases. Ketones are usually not present in HHS. We'll talk more in a minute about why mild DKA can have no detectable ketones, despite my original statement that ketoacidosis is a required feature of the syndrome. The anion gap in all forms of DKA is elevated, while is usually normal in HHS. Serum osmolarity in DKA can be very variable, while it is almost always increased in HHS, usually above 320 milliosmoles per kilogram. Mental status in mild DKA is usually normal, while in severe DKA and HHS it's usually altered. The alteration in consciousness seen in moderate to severe DKA is generally from either acidosis or dehydration, more so than from hyperosmolarity, which as I've st stated before, is the cause in HHS. An important question about these lab findings, why is the degree of hyperglycemia typically lower in DKA than HHS? After all, a blood sugar of 250 can be relatively close to typical for some uh, poorly controlled diabetics. There are two reasons for this. First, the acidosis in DKA leads to earlier symptoms and thus an earlier presentation than HHS. Second, patients with DKA tend to be younger with more preserved GFR and ability to excrete excess serum glucose. Now a few words about keto acids. Since they are such an important feature of DKA, I think it's important to un understand what exactly they are and where they come from. If you recall the prior slide outlining the pathogenesis of DKA and HHS, you may remember that insulin deficiency leads to increased delivery of free fatty acids to the liver. There, they undergo beta oxidation, which generates acetyl-CoA. This is the same acetyl-CoA that is the critical component of the Krebs cycle in cellular respiration. Here, however, the acetyl-CoA is transformed in the liver into acetoacetate, which is one of the three ketone bodies. Some acetoacetate will undergo spontaneous decarboxylation into acetone, which is actually not an acid and therefore does not directly contribute to the acidosis of DKA. Another portion of the acetoacetate will be reduced to beta-hydroxybutyrate using NADH as a proton donor. While acetone is not actually an acid, beta-hydroxybutyrate is not technically a ketone, but rather just a carboxylic acid. Thus, as mostly a point of trivia, while there are three classically described ketone bodies, Acetoacetate is the only one which is actually a true keto acid. Now we get to the problem with measuring ketone bodies in DKA. The standard nitroprusside assay that is used for their detection only detects acetoacetate and acetone and not beta hydroxybutyrate. Unfortunately, beta hydroxybutyrate is the predominant ketone formed during DKA. Thus, in mild cases of DKA, there may be insufficient levels of acetoacetate and acetone to be picked up and the urine and serum ketone assays may be falsely negative. While beta-hydroxybutyrate can be measured directly, this is a send-out test at most hospitals, including my own, the results of which do not come back in a clinically useful time frame. The last point to make about keto acids is that as part of the process of treatment of DKA with fluids and insulin, the beta-hydroxybutyrate will be oxidized back into acetoacetate. As a consequence, even though the patient may be getting better and their acidosis resolving, their ketone levels as measured by the nitroprusside assay may counterintuitively worsen. But this worsening is just a misleading artifact and should be ignored. For this reason, serial ketone levels should never be ordered during treatment of DKA.